So let's uh, get back to Michel Milio. So um, uh, we are on page uh, 359, I think. Um, I think we have the last paragraph of 359. Perfect. Uh, when I received your letter, uh, I saw that you already arranged for some Bachim to be in this program. You feel very bad to renege on your word. Certainly because it's going to cause them some damage. I'm not sure if my financial or psychological. Like what? I might be him, but I die for a cherim. I said to myself, certainly for others. Okay. But do less about free my law other than these barkim. Barley a double commercial kasafti. It's clear to me that what I wrote is correct. And he's a pakti. It's unsure. In the near docha gadol sheichnastenbo. Perhaps because of the great difficulty with which you in which you enter. In other words, you, know, you put yourself into, so to speak, untenable situation. So maybe, at least for the Bokhim who are already in the program, you should let them stay, right? Um, uh, uh, maybe we should have a couple exception for these boys. And to let everybody know, we call Ela, sorry, doesn't that everybody else know? She loves a couple of opening Ela, Shum Tony, no, something nobody will accept it in that format in the future. Now, she adopted him, you adopted some situation with your Shaman Shalibi. I knew you and I know you were a Shalom. Abati Lee, the Marley to be my heart said to me, he have Shalis Mohem should come do many soil. I'm confident that you can be only with his soil. The low so Siva with Sorazu owed any more add. Any further to this, uh, Ted, this uh, difficult situation? I have a come more, but still, we stop acting because I wasn't sure. But yes, the vine who in gamma match of my Nasten bow, perhaps the, the bit which you a little bit which you already uh put into the the, the few people already put into this program. Will I get a few sons at seven o'clock? Oh, perhaps it's a shortcoming that you have to uproot. Um, therefore, I went to the remarkable guy in the Chazanish Chathias people and asked him, uh, my, my, It is my uh, not to waste his time with simple matters. Which indicates that the, the Rav Desta was sure about everything he said till now without having to go to. The Chazanish. Only now, when it had to do, so he's sure that for the future, it should not be done. The only question was whether the Bachim are in there should suffer, those who already accepted this program should suffer or not, uh, for the greater good. His answer was, to cancel also that which you started and you promised. I went back and asked him, it's going to be a desecration of God's name. Then there's going to be a monetary loss. So I guess it's a financial issue, not a psychological one. It, it should not be so difficult for you. They can't have complaints against you. Since the reason why you're negative is because you got a letter from the Israel. I asked him again, to write that name of Chazanish. Does he accept by himself those complaints, etc.? They shivli, and he responded to me, "Kain, tichtavu shekach amarti." Right, that I said so. In Ezechiel, Amar, Amarti or Amarnu? It's interesting. That's what some died. What is the what the Chazanish said? Uh, amarti or Amarnu? You know, the Chazanish obviously had a tremendous personality besides his great goodness and tzaddik, because people who met the Chazanish clearly had an extraordinary impression of him. And to the point of that their, uh, their awe and their uh, respect was far greater than one finds for a simple, quote unquote, simple God of Lador. So obviously the Chazanish was remarkable. And that's why Rodessa's writing him with such uh, Moira. 
ואינני מוסיף לדבר, נראה לי אין לי עוד כן, אינני אומר את דעתי, אבל נוגע לסיפורי החינוך. I only understand the opinion in, in terms of the general the, uh, uh, organization of the education. And what I said, I believe is true. Uh, I, wrote, I wrote what I believe is true. Such as the financial loss, with the promises, and the, law, and the monetary damage. And then he posts, you know they don't pass it. I'm only telling you the hurrah of the past sack of the Chaznish. It caused me great difficulty to call it you anguish. Did they do see me as you know me from, from, from yesteryear? I really try to flee from such matters. But what can I do? The truth, according to my perception, compels me to write as I wrote. Your personal letters are so responding. Ach, I need us, but I am hasty. We more make those to complete this letter, Shikhsatib, which I wrote at Hayom up to today. Yom Hey Shlach, if they're partial Shlach, they also make the tears because of the numerous distractions. I don't want to cause it to tarry. Dovar Shamayim MS Bo. Because the word of heaven, truth is in it. But this is nechutza, and haste is necessary. But you are shemim achem. God shall be with you. Keep his cool. I lost mala mala. You should go higher and higher. But vodaso is barach in avodas Hashem. Asher tabdum nis yonis, and that which you will be able to withstand these temptations. The chazek as I meet us libchem should fortify the the truth of your heart. La vodaso is barach in terms of serving Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Scharchem kafu mechupa imen is barach ad olam. It should get doubled and, and quadruple reward. I am your strong friend who is clinging to your love, Elio uh, Eliezer Desler. Now, this, uh, uh, I want to share with you a couple of other things. Uh, screen share them with you. Um, one of them is like a, uh, um, a, um, a summary in English. So somebody wrote about this, uh, the Rav Desler Shita. Second, let me screen share it. Uh, where is this the right one? Yeah. Okay. So uh, somebody wrote here. I found out, uh, you know. He suddenly found it hard to accept what Rav Desler wrote. So this person who wrote, uh, I found, can you read this? Is it large enough? You're muted. I can, oh, I can see it. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Thanks, Ravi. I found it hard to accept the two, but I just read the letter. And there are actually two of them inside the Mikhtel. It's in volume three, starting on page 355. Rav Desler specifically cites a Maimur Chazal, that one has to go in and one comes out. But he goes much further. From what I can gather, there are no names, so you can't tell what institution was involved. Well, we know it was uh, Yeshiva and Gates. And it was apparently asked about setting up some sort of a seminary which would teach people how to be teachers. At first, they wanted the seminary to grant academic degrees, but he viewed that. And he told them they had to make a tally with the Bachrim, whether that they would not pursue a- a- academic degrees while they were learning there. They could only take Bachrim who might otherwise go straight to university. Finally, the second letter tells people who wanted to open the seminary that he discussed the Chazish, and the Chazish said they should close the seminary, seminary even at a monetary loss to the people who opposed to open it and to those who had enrolled. What is more striking is the reason given. The reason he gives, and I had heard it before, without attribution for the Mashgiach, one of the yeshivas here, is that the questions were open to such, uh, that if questions were open to such an institution, might tempt people who uh, might otherwise stay in learning and who might otherwise become Tamir Yachachavim, to leave learning and go get an academic degrees. It says explicitly that those who leave yeshivas should become, should better become storekeepers and not have professions because if they have professions, it would be too tempting to others to leave the yeshivas. He even admits that Frankfurt, because many of the Bachram did go college in a firm environment, produced fewer people went off the derech, but he also argues that it also produced fewer tamir He argues that better someone should go off the derech than that we should miss the chance to produce a Talmud Chacham. Powerful stuff. 
I continue to believe that there are other sheet that's known as Ram Shimon Flow Hirsch to argue otherwise and are supportable. I also think that Vesu Shita can be attacked as not applicable today because the percentage of the former vote that was in Kolon his time was so much smaller than it is today. And therefore, it had to be guarded more zealously and it did not face the economic realities that we face today. But I don't think it's possible to deny that Rav Desla Shita was and is as it was characterized on this list a few days ago. So uh, I don't think Rav Desla would have changed his opinion necessarily. Uh, certainly, he would not have changed his opinion unless the Chazim East changed his opinion, which is an important point to make. Now, would the Chazim East change his opinion? Not necessarily. I believe the Chazim East believed that Eretz Yisrael at should be a, a society where most of the uh, Orthodox Jews did work and make a living, but specifically in this format of either farmers or shopkeepers or other simple, mostly menial labor. And that there would be an elite of Talmud Chachamim who would not be attracted by that uh, simple uh, way of accomplishing a parnasa and would stay uh, in learning and become the Goli Hador. I believe that what the Chazanish was uh, more at the forefront of passing in halachas, which had to do with agriculture and uh, raising uh, livestock and all those kinds of things, because he believed that this was an actual ideal for most of the people who would make up Orthodox society in the land of Israel. So I don't know if he would have changed his opinion ever, not necessarily. On the other hand, I heard from one of my Rosh Yeshiva many years ago that he was present when the Chazanish said that, that it's not possible for the state of Israel to last for more than 10 years. So it's quite possible that had, again, he did not live lived long enough to see the state of Israel last for more than 10 years. So had he seen that the state of Israel lasted more than 10 years, he may have corrected course and seen that something has to be done differently, especially as society went away from agriculture and basic uh, simple uh, menial labor to a uh, different form of uh, uh, activity and a much more service and high tech based industry. So that is obviously something which we'll never know. And nobody knows and nobody could have predicted at the time. But there was a letter written, which I'll share with you now also by Rabbi, um, not this one, where is it here? Uh, which um, which was written by uh, Professor Zev Lev. And Professor Zev Lev was uh, famous to starting Machon Lev, which is not, it's not its official name. His name is the, the Jerusalem College of Technology, but uh, it's popular known as Machon Lev. And he was a Torim Derek Eretz educated uh, professor who uh, was uh, schooled uh, therefore in the the uh, school of Shom Shem Hirsch. And he wrote a very interesting, he was a time of Chacham and a professor. He wrote a very interesting response to Rav Dessler, which we'll take a look at now. Number one, introduction. I had the privilege of knowing the late revered Rabbi Dessler during the period when he lived in Israel. I often attend his Muslim talks given to professionals, in particular to physicians in private homes in Jerusalem. Many of those invited were of German Jewish or Anglo Jewish background and studied Torah in Lithuanian Shivas and had later studied academic institutions. In addition, I had many private conversations with Rabbi Dessler in Jerusalem and Nebrak, and he mentioned to me during the later years of his life, when he was living in Nebrak, that he had changed some of the ideas he had formed in England. When one studies Rabbi Dessler's writings, one should be careful to know during which period of his life the discourse referred to was delivered. It is possible that his change, the change in ideas was due partly to the repercussions of the Holocaust and partly to the, through the effect of life in Nebrak. Okay, so Rabbi, Professor Lev is already making a certain insinuation, obviously that Rav Dessler's views in the letters which we just wrote, learned were uh, linked to his having moved to Nebrak. Letter to which I first read in 5711, Nebrak a few years before his death in 5714. As you produce a bind to Leo, page 356 in it, Rabbi Dessler discusses relative advantages and disadvantages of the religious educational systems of Frankfurt, commonly referred to as termed their and though that of the yeshivas in Lithuania and Poland. His argument can be summarized as follows. The Frankfurt School support educational system, which the students were exposed to the study of secular subjects and later went down to universities. At the same time, paid attention to the strict observance of all mitzvahs. The advantage of the system was that the vast majority of its adherents stayed orthodox and carefully observed the ordinances of the Shulchan Aruch, despite the fact that they were exposed to a general non-Jewish intellectual environment. The price for, paid for this was that few, if any, Gedoli Torah emerged from such an educational system. This exposure to non-Torah ideals so ideas affected to some extent the purity of their faith in the absolute truth of Torah, 
resulting in strange compromises. The Lithuanian Rosh Yeshiva, on the other hand, set as their main objective to educate the Dolly Torah, discouraging all contact with intellectual world outside the Yeshiva. The price they paid, albeit willingly, was also heavy, since many of the Yeshiva students strayed from such an austere and difficult path and became irreligious in their encounter with Aska and other revolutionary movements. Those who left the Yeshiva world were advised to take simple, non-professional jobs. For example, a small businessman, rather than to study for academic career. Those Yeshiva students who did go on to study at university were therefore disregarded. Connection in Russia, Yeshiva, and, or, and these Orthodox University students was severed in order to prevent their exercising a detrimental influence on the rest of the Yeshiva students. The heavy price, the sacrifice, and many for the sake of a few potential of the Torah was based possibly in a ministry by Yikra Rabbah. So one, one thousand students entered the study Mikra, and only one emerges to Hurrah. The question discussed in Rabbi Dessa is of a great interest to all those who are concerned education. There'll be, there will be general agreement that it is of paramount importance to create the conditions that enable do, the Gdole Chachme Yisrael to develop and flourish. This elite is the backbone of the Jewish people and each generation. Any deterioration in the level of Torah learning, any significant decrease in the number of this elite group has serious repercussions for that particular generation, probably even for further gener future generations. We have used the term Gdole Chachem Yisrael following the Rambam. It clearly differentiates between Gdole Chachem Yisrael and Rashi Shivo and the members of the Sanhedrin. The first category is the top of the elite structure and takes priority all, over all other categories. In the introduction of the Torah, Rambam lists the name of rabbis in successive, successive generations until Rashi calls them Gdole Chachem Yisrael. Talented of those according to the Rambam studying Yeshivas during that period. And there's an important distinction which he makes, which you can buy into or you don't have to buy into. Which is that Russian yeshivas are not Gdol Yisrael. Russian yeshivas uh, can be Gdol Yisrael, but they're not necessarily Gdol Yisrael. In yeshivas, we study relatively little of the Talmud and very little of the Poskin. We study very much specific Masechtas and Halacha very often just out of Mishnah Bura. So, therefore, the question is whether yeshivas actually are producing Gdol Torah, or are they just producing people who will be the Russian yeshiva of the next generation? Now, the Kolo system came to alleviate that, to, uh, to mitigate that problem to a certain extent by making gear in Kolo, in Kolo, one studies many other disciplines of Torah, and one studies also relatively more halacha. But that is not necessarily true unless somebody deliberately embarks on that path in Kolo. In other words, Kolo can be a continuation of yeshiva and just be learning the same sex as begin over again. It could also be something else. But that already is not necessarily a, 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 a structure which actually will produce the Torah any more than the yeshiva system itself. Okay, so um, the emergence of a genius is a matter of chance, but it's possible to create conditions which enable it to flourish. It is obligatory in each generation to foster an atmosphere in which such geni a genius should he emerge can develop its full potentiality. In a sense, any system which can be given to such personality should be classified as pikuach nefesh ruchani, spiritual salvation of the Jewish people. Over the 30 years have elapsed since Rabbi Dessel wrote this letter. So this letter, this, this response is being written in the 1980s. We now have more information available about the two systems of education so clearly outlined by, outlined by Rabbi Dessler and the results so we can, now, we can suggest a number of pertinent questions which need objective examination. Is it true that the Lithuanian yeshivas constitute the main cradle of outstanding Kedoli Torah? What are the precise conditions needed to foster and nurture such personalities? Is there a correlation between the client Torah scholarship and the methodology of Torah and their What is the influence of general surroundings on yeshiva students? Yeshiva students also harbor two sets of cultural attitudes. What lessons can be learned from the experience of the systems of education which can serve as a guide to the current situation in the Torah world? And exhaustive treatment of these questions is clearly beyond the scope of a short article. It's not actually such a short article, but I do have to make a number of points which may stimulate others in, to think more deeply about these vital matters. Number two, factual analysis of the emergence of Dolly Torah in different Jewish centers of population. Okay, so he goes into this historically, and I'm gonna skip a couple of paragraphs. The growth of yeshiva students in Israel during the past 20 years is quite remarkable. We take all types of yeshivas and call them into account. The number of full-time yeshivas in Israel is about four or five times that in the USA. Today, it's probably 10 times as much, or even more as much. Um, so, Israel is only half of that in the USA, and the relative standard of living is much lower. 
And the other had number of Shomer Shabbos in Israel is over, about 25% of the population, or over 800,000, as compared to a few percent of the USA and Canada. These facts should be borne in mind when assessing the current Torah situation. It is particularly important, particularly important in our generation and the next, that in our generation, next generation, to strengthen these centers, which are so vital to the future of the of our people. Let us focus attention on Western Europe. Rabbi Dess has undoubtedly correct and stayed for several generations, not produced any Gaon in the stature of the Shagasari, the Ksois, the Minchaschina, the Yosamech, or the Ravachover. However, to conclude that time their heads was the main factor attributing this decline may well be simplistic. For generations before Shamshar, Western Europe had to import Kadoli Yad Torah from Eastern Europe. Examples like the Pnei Yoshua, the Shagasari, the Nadi Yehuda. The number going in Western Europe had decreased steadily over the past 400 to 500 years. In other words, amazing from the time to reshine it. The decrease was accelerated after the French Revolution and by the breakdown of the ghettos of ghettos and the impact of emancipation. Religious society was ill prepared to cope with the confrontation with Western civilization. It was only much later with the advent of Rosham Shmohosh that the trend of assimilation was partially halt halted. The impact of Tony Derkhez was not limited to his outskirts Gemeinde independent Orthodox community, but had an important influence on Orthodox and non-Orthodox society within the general Jewish communities. These included many of the Eastern European immigrants to the Western Europe before and after World War I, including many Hasidic adherents who, who could not and possibly did not wish to be integrated into outskirts Gemeinde. Such communities were not adhere to the philosophy of Torah Derek Eretz. They didn't have the philosophy, perhaps pragmatically as businessmen or semi-professionals. This is an important point to make, which is Torah Derek Eretz is a philosophy, but it's also a pra pragmatic approach, even if you don't have the philosophy. In other words, in America today, unlike Eretz Yisrael, you'll find many from professionals who actually went on, to, well, did go on to college, whether during yeshiva or after yeshiva, and got advanced degrees. And they might not believe uh, philosophically in Torah Derek Eretz, but they actually practice Torah Derek Eretz by virtue of the way they lead their lives, right? So hence, although it's factually correct to say that the educational methods of the Frankfurt School in German Jewish settings did not produce the Torah, there's no proof that it might not be more successful in another setting. One could infer that the method was not successful in the framework of Western Europe before the, where the vast majority of Jews had become assimilated. And perhaps that was a problem. Western Europe before World War I, there are no advanced centers of Torah and study and quality of the quality of the Lithuanian yeshiva. So at a time span, time span of 100 years, no exception to the Torah appeared. Though some could only move to Western Europe, their influence was not, not very significant. Okay, so then he goes into various different uh, possibilities which could have emerged both in the German, uh, 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 Eastern European influence moving to Germany and the German influence moving to Lithuania, right? Um, there was, uh, and he really discusses some things about that, which I don't have to get into right now. And this is certainly true that uh, the Torah, it was clear that Torah Derek Harris was helpful in stopping the inroads of assimilation in Western Europe. Um, and uh, it should be said that also in Eastern Europe, after the First World War, the, the methods of Torah Derek Harris were also imported into Eastern Europe because they also had to face at that time their own problems of assimilation. So uh, there is, uh, so it's not so simple that the method of Torah only which was the methodology of the yeshivas in Eastern Europe at one point would be successful anywhere on earth today, although it seems to be successful in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, it seems to have been successful in Eretz Yisrael, but now that seems producing its own problems of people who are leave the uh, derech and uh, find that they are not able to fit in. And then he goes into the number three, he goes into a very interesting discussion whether the yeshiva system produces Gedolei Torah. And he claims, I'm skipping a paragraph here. I discussed the fact with many Rashi of the last generation, and the general consensus was that Yeshiva served the good and very good student, but not the brilliant student. The brilliant students best went, best went, went their best, best brilliant students went their own way. This is clarified for me by Lay Reb Chatzke San and Rosh Yeshiva Yeshiva's Chevron Yerushalayim. His policy was not to limit the exceptional students in any way, let them study anywhere they wish, in any base marriage, not necessarily Yeshivas at their own pace, according to their own timetable, with anyone they wanted, having to report to him only once a week. Felt that even Yeshiva Schemon, which is generally considered to be the best Yeshiva to produce the only Torah in the world, would hinder their progress. A genius is usually restricted by a stru structured atmosphere. 
Rabbi Dess does not actually state that the yeshivas produce the Holy Torah, but sa says it is their stated goal to do so. The inference that the yeshivas actually produce Godolin does not seem to be borne out by the fact. The yeshivas produce at best Russian yeshivas, the same pattern as the yeshivas in which they study. However, it is possible that the produce Godolin, a total environment, is required that puts great value on our elite system, and this environment is undoubtedly produced by the yeshivas. The graduates of Tamir Chomim appreciate and revere a God of Torah and hence encourage a latent genius to achieve his potentiality. One can therefore perhaps interpret the matter that a thousand enter Mikra, a hundred Mishra, ten Talmud, only one emerges to be the Baal Ra, as saying that the statistics show that only one out of a thousand has the potentiality for genius. An atmosphere of many is needed to nurture the one. However, the basis on this matter ideology that it may be necessary to sacrifice hundreds, if not thousands of students for the sake of one is far fetched and dangerous, probably not in accord with Chazal and Halacha. Rabbinic and lay leadership have been have to be watched over the thousands as over the one genius and should be held responsible for the failure to do so. This is a very big question. What is the responsibility of a Rosh Hashiva? Responsible Rosh Hashiva to be responsible for the totality of the students, or is responsible Rosh Hashiva to be responsible to be the Dole Torah or the Rosh Hashiva of the next generation? There is no one right answer. One out of every Rosh Hashiva is going to be different. The Ravessler seems to be, um, however, stating that it is necessary for the yeshivas, at least uh, the ones which are going to listen to him and Chazanish, to choose the side that they're going to be concerned with the production of Gedole Yisrael and not with the production of Balabatim who are Rehim Shlevi. And then he goes on to say that um, how in America, even though um, uh, perhaps it wasn't the the the, the, the state philosophy. People like Rishraga Fivel Mendelovich, who uh, started Torah Sora and was with the head of the Torah with us, uh, did start these uh, the um, types of yeshivas which cater to many uh, different uh, types of people. And but he did take, as it says here, Lithuanian Russian yeshivas at institution, even though he may have disagreed with some of their philosophies, which is true that. You have yeshiva, which has one a philosophy A, but hires Rosh Yeshiva of type B. Okay, so then he has a uh, a, um, a discussion of whether uh, the, uh, the the in fact the Frankfurt School um, did create a strange type of uh, hashkafa, strange type of compromise, and he says that. Uh, even nowadays, there is some more than a grain of truth in the statement. It's probably valid for many Orthodox Jewish scientists, even more so for many for Jewish sociologists, psychologists, economists, and lawyers. It has, it has been difficult for me to understand how an Orthodox Jew can become a lawyer or judge. He practiced law according to a system based on non-Jewish philosophy of justice, and I am doubtful whether this is permitted by Allah. It's an interesting statement. It's interesting that in the world in terms of there are two different approaches. There's the approach of the scientists and the approach of the humanists. And the scientists are convinced that their heritage is only sustainable in sciences, not in humanities. And the humanities people are convinced that turn their heritage is only sustainable in humanities, not in the sciences. The question is how do you look at turning their heritage? Is turning their heritage Torah together with the um, uh, the their heritage of the Miflo Sabori of science? Or send their head together with the the flow sabori of psychology and human uh, human spirit, and uh, there, obviously again, there's no one answer, but people seem to choose the answer based on their own inclinations. Um, this says only a few religious scientists have created valuable synthesis. Many think professionals, the formerly yeshiva students, the formerly yeshiva students, find themselves struggling with problems at different times. The doubts and questions have not been resolved even after discussion with their Rosh Yeshiva, who often do not appreciate the depths of their the depth of the problems. In my view, there's nothing wrong with this as long as these people stay within the Orthodox school and maintain the basic tenets of our faith. No one dies from honest questions and the search for solutions to real problems, as long as this basic faith and eternal validity of Torah remains unshaken. It's only the naive, the ignorant, or the person who consciously closes his eyes or ears to his surroundings who has not at some stage of his life experienced problems with belief. It's only when a person stops to believe in terms of Shemaim, the question becomes biased and skeptical. And even though I may still observe mitzvahs, technically, uh, his attachment to the Torah community has not been severed. Shalos Mino that the above criticism by Abba Desla may apply to many yeshivas, say. It's virtually impossible, even for a cloistered person, 
not to be aware of the multicultural surroundings in the state of Israel or the Western world. The secular radio, the newspapers, even content conversations with people who are not religious or do not have yeshiva background must exercise an influence. This can easily be seen, for example, an American yeshiva student when he is put in a different setting, say in yeshiva in Israel. His cultural attitudes from eating to reading are American as homeland is in, in a deep sense as the USA. Feels at home there, whether because of baseball or business, food or newspapers or politics. In a sense, he is an American as an Orthodox Jew and a budding town of Chacham, and it's not basically different from a pre war German Orthodox Jew, except, and this is important, that he's far more of a Yeshiva student and has more, far more of a desire to increase his total rate. However, deep inside, he does not consider the USA as goes, and in this sense, he is strongly culturally assimilated. Although studying Yeshiva combines two different sets of values. Some of the consequences can be seen today in the advent of women's liberation movement in Orthodox circles and the rapid increase in divorce rate, even among Yeshiva graduates. Because of the permeating influence of the outside world, educational methods were applicable in, Thua in the Yeshivas of Lithuania and Poland may not be sufficient for the second or third generation of American or Israeli Yeshiva students and graduates. However, there's one the, the significant difference between the modern Yeshiva students at Frankfurt School. The latter carried a banner on ideology, the present generation of Yeshiva students and goals disavows this ideology in theory much more than Rabbi Dessler does well, in practice, they themselves behave among uh, similar lines, which obviously creates a tremendous problem in Hashkafa and a contradiction, in, uh, which is, it leads to difficult uh, issues in philosophy among Yeshiva Bakrim. I like this story here. A story may help illustrate this last point. Well, the rabbi in Jerusalem, a former Talmud of Shem and Shkup, asked me once whether, whether I really believed that the astronauts had reached the moon and set foot on its surface. When I answered affirmatively, he said he did not believe it. He considered that it was all propaganda since the Rambam states that the moon is a spiritual object. Incidentally, there's a complete misunderstanding of Rambam's position. Asked what he would do if two deeply religious Jews came to him and declared under oath that they had walked on the moon. He answered this would, in his opinion, throw down at all the sayings of the Rambam. This would have serious consequences for his personal religious beliefs, religious commitments, and beliefs. He would not entertain possibly the Rambam rejected the knowledge of science in his time and that if he had lived today, he might have made a revision of the first four chapters of the Yara Chazaka. So if you have that attitude today, you're going to face a lot of problems. Not going to know, uh, you're going to have to dismiss. And people do have, sometimes, as Dushim Bakram, take on the most uh, extreme conspiracy theories, like saying people never land on the moon in order to reconcile themselves with this kind of thinking. But uh, as the, as the, the Professor Lev's position was that one has to um, try and understand these things with a appropriate, holistic, complete philosophy. Seems to me that we'll just gonna read to the end here of the text. It seems to me therefore that one can avoid tackling such fundamental problems, even the yeshiva and the kol. There indeed, if one wants to preserve the purity of their Torah, Person wants to strive to be a perfect Jew, there's only two possibilities. Either be unaware of the problem, be a tummy, something very difficult to maintain in our society, but the strength is believed in the so much that he can grapple with many different problems that society imposes on us. The implication that the Rosh Hashim and, and, and Mashkiach and our generation is going deep and more year of Shemaim with an awareness of the problem and ability to resolve them from a Torah standpoint. Now, the, the, here there's a bracket in a note from a, t another, a common Rav Dessel named Rabbi Ari Kamel, who was one of the editors of the Mikhtamil. In his own approach, the conflict was presented uh, to him by students, Rabbi Dess has never satisfied a superficial reconciliation. By in-depth analysis of both the contemporary challenges and basic Torah principles, he showed how the challenge disappeared when viewed from the proper Torah perspective. Many examples of this approach may be found in the pages of Mikhtar Melio. Okay, I think that that is enough. I don't think that we have to go through any of the notes here, um, except for this one I wanted to do, which is uh, about the continuation of the conversation about the moon. The conversation continues as follows. I asked him whether he believed all that's been in the Rambam. He answered yes. I asked him whether he goes to a doctor or follows the medical advice of the Rambam. He kind of that he goes to a doctor because he does not understand those, these portions of the Rambam. I point out that there's another portion of the Rambam regarding the moon which he does not understand. Okay, so sort of here. what can you do? Okay, any comments or we go on next week to a new topic? Or do you want to think about it? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't. I don't have any comments at the moment. Okay. Okay. I hope it wasn't too boring. No, it's very exciting, actually. Yeah. It was like um, it was initially super harif, so I was a little bit nervous, but today was a today was a, a, a mahalach I like to follow more. Okay. I like to.
Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we'll speak next week. Take care. Take care. Really, Okay. Bye-bye.